Hello everyone and welcome to the Kids Matter Early Childhood webinar, Social Learning, More Than Taking Turns and Making Friends. It's great to be back. We're back for 2015 and this is our fourth in a series of eight webinars. So we've got another four to, to offer you in the next, between now and June. So, but we're looking forward to the next six months. It's going to be great. So anyway, thank you. Back to today. Thank you for attending. And my name is Amelia Joyce and I'm a project officer with Kids Matter Early Childhood. Some of you might be closely connected with the initiative, but for those of you who haven't been, um, Kids Matter Early Childhood is an initiative that's funded by the Department of Health and Beyond Blue. It's grown into what it is today between a partnership through with Kids Matter Early Childhood, um, with Early Childhood Australia, Beyond Blue and the Australian Psychological Society. Shortly we'll be joined by two of my favourite facilitators, Janelle Boulder and Sarah Richardson. So they'll be guiding our reflections about what social learning is and the way being social influences mental health and wellbeing. But before we go any further, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the many lands that we're all meeting on tonight. If you haven't popped in where you are from the chat, in the chat already, feel free to do so now too, because already we've noticed that there are people from all across the nation. It's been great. So I would like to pay my respects to the elders past, present and future, for they hold the memories, the traditions, the culture and hopes of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. I'd also like to acknowledge that Aboriginal communities have a strong history of being social and understanding social rules. Especially, this is really highlighted for me when I, when I just look at the map that we've got up on the screen for you now, the complexity and the intricacies that, would have, that are involved in being social within and between the kinship groups and country is, is really quite amazing. Seven years ago, there was an apology made to the Stolen Generation, and almost two weeks ago, I took the opportunity to attend a live webcast. This webcast was called Telling Our Stories, Healing Our Stolen Generations. We've popped the URL up on the slide as well for you to all have a look at at some point. This, um, this, yeah, thank you for that. This, um, this webinar had, it was a great opportunity to actually hear some stories from pe of people and it highlighted the far-reaching impact of children being stolen from their families, their culture and their country. The people that shared their stories, they were sharing stories of trauma, survival and their unwavering commitment to healing themselves, each other and future generations. If you do get a chance to watch, watch the webinar, the, the Healing Our Stories webinar, really take some time to, to talk about it with others afterwards as well. As I experienced the event myself, I was in the midst of preparing for tonight and I frequently considered how the social learning of generations has been impacted by the forced removal of Aboriginal children. I was reminded that context, culture, relationships, experiences and history all influence what, what we learn about being social. And also I was reminded about how much being social is connected to our identity, how we live and our mental health. Janelle and Sarah are going to build on this for me tonight, I'm sure of it as they take us, on a pro take us through a process of reflecting about social learning. The social learning of our children, ourselves, and how culture and context really influence what we know about being social. So tonight I encourage you to do two things that you could potentially build into reconciliation action plans. The first is to think about the webinar topics that we discuss in terms of how we can build on from the, from the apology that was made seven years ago as individuals and together. And the second is to consider ways to communicate with colleagues, friends, family and children about how social structures, connections and intergenerational mental health and wellbeing have been impacted by the forced removal of children from the stolen generations. It's also important tonight as we're reflecting on all these things to consider that we're all, that we're all here to learn and reflect about early childhood, wellbeing and education. When interacting and engaging with each other online, I do please ask you to be mindful of our unity and respectful of our diversity. And it's also important to remember that these topics that we've discussed can trigger memories, feelings and thoughts, even difficult ones. So please be aware of what comes up for you and make sure you talk to someone if any difficulties or difficult feelings do occur. You can also check out the website, which is, we've popped the URL up on the slide for you to have a look at for more information about who to contact. Our presenters tonight, Janelle and Sarah, they're looking forward to putting what being social means under the spotlight. 
and they have provided us with many opportunities during the webinar to be social by using the chat function. So, hi Janelle and Sarah, you're here. Hi, Hello, everybody. <laughs> Welcome. Hi, everyone. So, so, in a moment, I'll be, I'll be popping off in a moment. But before we do that, I'll just have a quick chat to you about about the chat function. Some some people might not be a fan of chat. You can actually minimise the chat. If you hover your mouse over the little dots around the border and you drag, you can actually adjust the size. Or if you want to get rid of your chat completely, there's a little triangle that you can click on to minimise. And if you want to get it back again, you just do the same. You click on the little tri triangle and it comes back. So that's the that's chat function. But we've also got an opportunity to do some to do, do some polls as well. So while while, while I'm here and Janelle and Sarah are here as well, let's just do the first poll so everyone can have a practice. This poll tonight is really just to just to get a sense of which educational settings that you are connected with. So I'm just about to start the poll now and we'll pop that up so you can type in more than more than one. Um, and also if we've if we've let any others if we've left any out, please let us know and we can pop that in the chat too. It's a fairly even spread tonight, Amelia. It does. We'll give it a little bit longer and then we'll pop we'll pop the results up for everyone to, to see. Lots of family day yeah. people with us tonight. That's great. Excellent. Okay, so I'll stop the poll and there's some other ones too. So we'll have a look in while I'm while I've gone, I'll have a bit of a check in the chat to see where everyone else is from so we can give you a big hello when I come back next. So here's the results of the poll. So can I just confirm that you can see all that, everyone? Excellent. Okay, so yeah, it is very even spread across a whole range of different educational settings. So I'm going to duck off now and I'm going to actually leave, leave you in the hands of Janelle and Sarah to explain what's happening for the rest of the night and I'll pop back in a little bit for another poll. See you soon, everyone. Bye, Amelia. Bye, Amelia. Thanks. So, um, thanks, Amelia. And, um, Thanks for letting us know where you're, where, where you're from, everybody. It's great to um, see a whole range of different um, people from a whole range of different settings. And hopefully all of you are going to um, be able to um, share some of the social ideas about social learning with us tonight. So to kick off, I just wanted to, I guess, let you know what kind of things we're going to cover. At Kids Matter, we believe it's really important to explore social understanding and skills because they're a significant protector for good mental health. And Kids Matter is a is a mental health initiative. So often, and often, what we talk about social de social development together with emotional development. And what Janelle and I really wanted to do was see if we could explore social development on its own. This has proved to be quite an interesting process. Janelle and I have had lots of conversations that have kind of really challenged us. Perhaps we haven't always agreed with each other. Um, and in trying to separate the two, the social and emotional development, we discovered actually that it's not really possible. But we, in the process, we've learned a lot about social development as we've gone along. So I guess tonight what we want to do is share some of that learning with you. Um, and we can continue our conversation that Janelle and I have started um, with you during the webinar, but you can join in in the chat wherever you can. And I think we'll, we'll probably try and continue afterwards, perhaps on the blog or on the Facebook page. Thanks, Sarah. So we'll start to set the scene of this webinar by defining what we mean by social learning, describe where social development fits in a child's total development, and then we'll connect this to mental health. Next, we'll explore in more detail what it means to be social and identify the skills and understandings that are needed. And following on, we'll have a look at how we become social, make links to the early child to early childhood practice, and finish off by looking at ways we can support the social learning of children we work with. So let's move on to, to set the scene for this webinar that's entitled Social Learning, More Than Taking Turns and Being Friends. 
just wait for the next slide to go up. Yeah, almost there. Here it is. So Sarah, do you remember our conversation around whether empathy was a social or an emotional skill? And we disagree until we realise that empathy is actually a combination of both social and emotional skills. And even though we realise it's artificial to separate social and emotional skills, it's a really useful exercise to strive as we strive to support children's mental health, well-being and learning. First let's set the scene by defining the terms we use today and then I'll explore what it means to be social. The graphic that's on your screen now looks at how kids and early childhood has organised children's social and emotional skills into three core areas. This will guide us as we look at what each of these team, uh, terms mean. So a sense of self is about children's developing capacity to feel positive about themselves and their capabilities. This is really similar to a person's sense of identity and the words developing capacity are particularly important in early childhood given the enormous amount of learning that takes place in the first five years of life. Emotional skills refer to the children's developing capacity to recognise, express, and regulate their feelings, while social skills refer to children's developing capacity to interact successfully with others. So emotions are to do with feelings and being social is to do with interacting with others. Some people refer to positive social skills as being pro-social and negative social skills as being anti-social. I think it's also important to remember that some people can find the social world a real challenge. Struggling with one or more, one or two areas of social understanding can have a major impact on their relationship. For today's purposes, we're going to use the term social skills. So this does include social understanding, social behaviour, social learning, social competence, social communication, and so on. The terms are really are really interchangeable in in the literature. As this diagram shows, the areas overlap and some skills may fall into one more than one area. The example of empathy that challenged Sarah and I, what do you think? Is it a social or an emotional skill? I think empathy is about understanding your own feelings, which is an emotional skill, and the feelings of others which is both social and emotional. And it's also know, about knowing what another person knows, that you understand what they're thinking and feeling, which is both social and emotional. Social interactions are a lot more successful when people are empathetic with each other. Sorry, I've lost my note. Sorry, 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 I'm nearly there. So you can see how empathy includes both emotional and social elements as it's to do with both feelings and interacting with others. These three core areas do influence the way we view ourselves and others and how we interact with others and how we function in the world. They're considered essential considerations for children's development of good mental health and well-being, but they also provide a useful way to think about, organise and be intentional about social and emotional learning. Positive social and emotional skills are synonymous with good mental health. This is what underpins kids matter. Behaviours are actions we see that lead us to think, interpret and wonder about what's happening to children social and emotion, socially and emotionally. Children communicate their social and emotional capacity and assert sense of their identity 
through their behaviours, through what they do. Noticing patterns of behaviour over time offer clues for planning relevant and meaningful social experiences for a child. For example, at packing away time, you might often see a child underneath a table curled up in a ball. Let's call this behaviour hiding. Take a moment to use the chat to let us know what you think this behaviour might be indicating. What do you think this child might be thinking or feeling? It's really tempting to judge others by their behaviour rather than their intentions. We judge ourselves by our intentions. We know what we mean. But learning to judge children by their intentions is a skill worth developing. We'll take some time to discuss your responses to this question a little bit later on. But what does it mean to interact successfully with others? What does it mean to be social? That's the next big question. As we move on to the next slide. What does it mean to be social? So being social is a very complex area made up of emotional, cognitive, behavioural and executive functioning concepts. The Kids Matter framework identifies cooperation, joining in, communication and seeking help as key social skills. But to further understand this, it's helpful to explore what happens inside a social interaction. And whatever happens inside a social interaction happens within a split second. So you'll see how complex it is as we go through it. We're biologically wired to relate to each other, to others. In fact, the human species can't survive alone. Being social is critical to how we function in the world and how we think and feel about ourselves and others. Research shows that our social capacity develops within the relationships we have with important people. And this starts from birth. You learn to be social when immersed in social experiences or relationships and while observing others involved in relationships. Later experiences build on those that have gone before. People of all age groups interact and are social with each other. So a child interacting with an educator is using similar social skills as those used with a peer or their older siblings. The graphic on this slide represents what being social looks like. And I've organised it into six steps or sections to highlight what does happen inside a social interaction. So number one, the very first thing, people need to be motivated to make contact or interact. Most people are internally motivated. But some people are motivated, they want to join in, but they might struggle with the how, the when, or the why. Number two is knowing how to approach or join a group to start an interaction. Kids Matter Early Childhood highlight joining in as a key social skill. Number three is about responding when someone does approach you or join in. So Sarah, I'm going to ask you a question which is one way people approach each other. While I ask Sarah the question, watch us both closely and make a note in the chat of the non-verbal factors that support our interaction. So I'm just waiting for Sarah's face to come back up on the screen. Here I am. Hello. Can't see your face yet. There you are. So really hard question, Sarah. Mm -hmm. What time? Did you go to bed last night? I went to bed at 10.30. I knew I had to get a good night's sleep, so I wasn't tired for today. Good choice, Sarah. <laughs> so you may have noticed that the word to be used had an appropriate pitch, tone, volume, pace, and intonation that matched the context of what we were talking about. The feel of the interaction would have been very different if I said, so what time did you go to bed last night? 
or what time did you go to bed last night? Adds a whole different tone to our interaction. With our non-verbals, I'm hoping you noticed that we smiled at each other, that we looked at each other, we waited, we listened. Sarah demonstrated an understanding of the words I used through the way she answered, through the way she responded, and she demonstrated an understanding of that turn taking of communication, the to and fro, or the serve and return. We're using social communication while we have a social interaction today, but communication is a really important social skill that includes more than just words and is one of kids that early childhood's key social skills. So there's the things you could see and hear our talking and our non-verbal interaction. But underneath the words, there are a number of important social understandings that greatly influence our ways of being social. I knew and I trusted Sarah's intention, and she knew and trusted mine. So we had an understanding of the intentions of each other. We had a sense of each other's feelings and that impact on how we relate to each other. I realised that Sarah is likely to view the situation right now in a slightly different way to me because we understand that others see the world differently or have a different perspective. Sarah, Amelia and I are demonstrating our understanding of the different social rules in this online social world we're in at the moment. Just as there are different social rules at a trivia night at a club or sitting on a plane or being in a busy early childhood setting. Our actions can reflect a variety of wants, needs, values and morals that we've learned from the culture and the context of our own experiences growing up. We also have individual, we all have lost it again, we've also had an individual something, 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 where is it? I'll just go on to um, maintaining. So we've talked about being motivated, approaching, responding, and now we're up to maintaining, maintaining contact. So people that are pro-social are more likely to be able to maintain contact. Children who maintain contact may play the shared experience together for lengths of time perhaps have a higher number of serves and returns, or seek each other out regularly over a long period of time. If you maintain contact, you're more likely to be more successful at taking turns, negotiating and cooperating. Cooperation is another one of kids matter early childhood key social skills. There may be more chance of maintaining a social relationship over time if there's an emotional investment or a friendship. But people who are not necessarily friends can still interact socially. We can't be friends with everyone. Are you friends with everyone that you know? But we do need to be able to interact effectively and be friendly with people. And taking terms in sharing. I often hear people say, we all share here, but what does that mean? Does that mean one child has to give up what they're playing with so another child can have a turn? I think about sharing more as sharing a focus or sharing a space or sharing a room rather than sharing equipment. Number five, the fifth section, is about knowing when the game changes. What do you do if someone changes the subject in a conversation or two extra children join a play space? This could well involve negotiation or problem solving or using some executive functioning skills. Does a change mean the interaction is finished or that it's becoming more complex? Are the participants still motivated? 
the last idea in this process, number six, is of course knowing when the interactional game is finished. How do you know it's finished? Is the finishing your idea or your partner's idea? How are you going to manage that inevitable transition? So underlying this process is having an understanding and the ability to act appropriately. As we know that being pro-social is a strong protective factor for mental health. Some people could be considered to be antisocial if they don't have this ability. Knowing what is appropriate, when and where, and having the ability to self-regulate accordingly is critical. The word appropriate often comes up when we're talking about emotional, social and behavioural skills. But appropriate to who? Who decides when it's appropriate? Which bit is inappropriate? Who decides what is appropriate? That's our next poll question that we're moving on to now. Have a think about it while we get the poll up. Who decides what's appropriate in your setting? Thanks, Janelle. Okay, we'll just get the poll up now for everyone to start seeing. So who decides what makes something appropriate? There we go. So again, we'll give you a little bit of time to fill it in. Um, there's been lots of conversation, conversation going around um, through everyone around all the different things that we can that we, we noticed about hiding and also the other question that you just recently asked Janelle, it's just escaped my mind at the moment. Um, oh, around um, Sarah's non -verbal. non verbal. Yes, Sarah's non verbals, that's the one. And also the empathy and wh wh whether or not it was social or emotional. So I'll, while, you, while everyone's finishing up, we'll just have a little bit of a reflection about some of those things that came up. Um, oh, there was one other thing that really stood out, out for me as well. Someone mentioned that it's really important to consider things like eye contact and and those non-verbal within the culture and the context of the situation and the person, the people that are involved in the interaction. So I'll stop the poll now, pop the stat shot up. Let's see. So it's we've got isn't that, that the leaders are quite influential in deciding, as, almost as influential as, as families. I love, it. I love seeing that children are deciding though too. I think yeah. that's really important. That's excellent. Well, I think children are going to decide anyway, whether we let them or yeah. whether we value what their decisions are. Because they will decide if you're going to be my friend or if you're allowed to play with me or not. It's about what we do with that, I guess. Yeah, definitely. Okay, well, I think we, we move on to the next bit. So I think it's time for me to say goodbye. And I think Chanel might be saying goodbye too. And we're handing over to Sarah. We'll see yep. you soon, everyone. Okay. Thanks, everybody. So I guess um, what we'd like to do now is just to refocus our thinking um, and reconnect with the idea of being social and um, early childhood mental health. So this is the definition that we use in Kids Matter, uh, the definition of early childhood mental health that we use here in Kids Matter. And I guess the thing that we can really notice in this definition is how critical those social skills are. We've already talked about a lot of them. Um, and, and so these social skills are not just important for being the social skills, but they're important for, our, for, for children's emerging um, mental health both now but also into the future. So you'll notice the highlighted section, it says that children are able to participate in the social environment. And Janelle's already talked a little bit about that. The other really important underpinning factor is about being able to form healthy and secure relationships. And that last one, which is what we've kind of just been just touching on briefly is interact appropriately. And understanding and recognising about how to be appropriate and when to be appropriate and, and those questions that Janelle was asking about you know what is appropriate and who decides that um, is a really interesting question. So I just wanted to as I said we just wanted to connect back in with the fact that it's really important to talk about social learning because it's really connected to good mental health. 
So moving on now, what, we, what we're going to start doing is exploring and learning about, about being social and, and becoming social and where we learnt about, where we learnt those things. So we're going to jump back into another poll. Yes, I'm back again. I'm, yes, I'm, sorry. I'm not on <laughs> screen, but I'm sorry. just started the poll for everyone around, would I like you to consider finishing the question for us? And again, you can answer multiple, multiple ways. How did you learn to be social? I learned to be social from or as. And why are you doing and, that? I just, just, oh no, you go. I was just going to say, if you've got anything else you want to say, just pop it in the chat. <laughs> yeah. What were you going to say, Sarah? Oh, I was going to say, you know, um, if before we think about teaching children to, to be social, it's a good idea to stop and reflect about how we learnt to be social. Where did our learning come from? Um, because that will influence how we learnt to be social, how we teach, what we teach. Are you new to the media? No, I'm not. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here, everyone. So social one rules of these. for being online. Yes. Yes, we have to mute ourselves, otherwise you hear people clicking. Okay, so I'm just going to stop the poll and pop the snapshot up for you. And I guess the results actually highlight for me um, the importance of some of family. And, and that's one of the guiding principles of the Kids Matter Early Childhood Framework, that, that families are, are central to supporting children in their learning and their growing and their developing. Followed, and then followed closely by what we can do as educators in, in the spot, in, in the place to help support that growing too. Would you, either either of you two like to make any comment about that? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> of course. <laughs> it's interesting, isn't it, that um, lots of people have said that you learn those things as a child, but you continue to learn those things as you go through your life, like as a teenager and then again, and continue to learn as an adult. So these social things are things, you know, are not, Fixed. We continue to learn and evolve, and I think that actually that's Julie B just said that too. Oh. Just let you know yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's because we do. It is about our context and about the the environment that we're in. Did you want to say something, Janelle? And we're always living in a context, and our context changes over time. Mm. So that's what um, helps with our social development. Mm. Mm. That, that ties in really closely with what you were going to talk about next, um, Sarah, around Broffenbrenner's social ecological yeah. model. Yeah, one of the um, underpinning frameworks that we use in Kids Matter is the Broffenbrenner model um, and the socio-ecological model which, which talks about the multiple influences on children's um, social learning, well, more broadly they're, they're all their learning, but we're talking particularly about social learning and, and children, both and, and all of us both influence and are influenced by our context and we can see that that continues over time. Um, and again, Bronson Brenner would, would say that the child is very influenced by the, their close co context, their family, their culture, and people have already been picking up some of those things already. But early childhood and school fits in with that, with that model too. And in, in Kids Matter, we say that the interconnection between the child, their community and their family is critical to, to their mental health. So I think it's really important that we, we consider all these contexts, both for ourselves but also for the other people, that, the children, the family um, and our colleagues, I think, too. One particular thing that I guess is really important part of this, and we've touched on this a little bit too, is the idea of social rules or social norms and how we learn to understand what these are and also how we teach children about these rules. And I, I won, and it connects back into that idea of appropriateness. And I, I wonder, you know, we often say children learn how to, to behave at grandma's. They know that they can do all the things differently at grandma's than they can at home and at early childhood, in their, in their early childhood setting. But I wonder what happens when children bring those rules, either on purpose, they, they want to try out what will happen if they try that out in a different setting. Or sometimes I think it's about helping them make that transition from one place to the next, and we, get, and we know how critical transitions are. So I think that's a really interesting thing to explore. And the other thing to explore about social rules in particular is the idea that sometimes the, rule, the social rules are unspoken or unwritten, and I think sometimes we, ha we haven't interrogated them enough or challenged them enough. We know they're there, 
but we don't know why and we don't know where they came from. They're just how we do it here. That's just what we do. So I think one of the things that's really important in terms of social learning is to be really clear about our own ideas and our own understandings and our own values around what it means to be social and how we should be social. So we're going to move on now and start um, thinking about Vienna. And this is a case study that we um, sent copies um, to people when they registered and we made available um, on Facebook as well, I think. Um, if you haven't read the case study yet, that's fine. And it will be available afterwards. I think um, Amelia put it in the chat earlier today. But, but I'll just give you a little bit of an introduction to Sienna. Um, and we'll use Sienna to explore, again, some of the, the ideas that Janelle has been talking about already. So what we can see from Sienna is that she's got some social strengths that are really going to help her into the future. And what you might want to do is, if, you, if you've read it, you might want to talk to them, add your ideas about what Sienna's social strengths are in the chat. Um, and Janelle and I are going to give you a bit of an idea about what some of the things we have noticed. Um, in, and I'm going to do that in the three ages and stages that Sienna is. So from a baby, we know that she's people oriented. And Janelle's already said that we're hardwired from birth to connect with other people. It's a, it's a critical um, survival mechanism that humans have. So being connected, being social is, is an important part of um, survival as a human. Sienna and her dad have a really close relationship and they really want to communicate and they really enjoy joining in with each other. They've got a strong motivation to be social. So Sienna's learning about being social by experiencing it with her dad, by watching and also by practicing. So then as she becomes a toddler, her social context expands. So she's now going to childcare. So she's got an opportunity to increase that capacity. And she, she shows us that she enjoys connecting with adults and it, and it talks about her giving and receiving hugs and kisses. She's using her trusted adults as, as a reference point to check out, is this how I do it here? Is this, is this the rules for here? So, and she's using that in a non-verbal way. And I think that shows her desire to want to cooperate and want to join in, to belong, to fit in. Her, her words also, she's beginning to add words to her non-verbal actions and also wanting to join and seek help and offer help sometimes. And then as a preschooler, um, Janelle was talking before about pro-social behaviour. You can see a lot of pro-social behaviour um, in Sienna as a preschooler. She responds to her friend's cue. She expresses her ideas and feelings um, very effectively and very openly. She's very happy to do those things. She makes attempts at cooperative play. Um, so we can see a lot of social strengths already in, in her um, emerging just from that really small snippet. I think you can, I would say that Sienna is a communicator, a joiner um, and a cooperator. I'm just wondering, Janelle, what you think? So I think it's fascinating to see how strong Sienna's communication skills were even before she used the words and how central her communication skills are to her social development and moving from that non-verbal stage through to the word she used and full um, and using full conversation. Yeah. And it's also interesting how her other social understandings emerged through how she used all those important adults in her life and how they responded to her and to each other. Mm. Really shows All of those things I was talking about in terms of the Bronson Brenner model, and you were, you've just been mentioning relationships, and I think again I talked about from the mental health perspective that relationships are critical, um, and we can see that they are integral to, to Sienna's social learning. In Kids Matter, our framework based on evidence that says that um, relationships are fundamental to good mental health, and the EYLF talks about secure receptive respectful reciprocal relationships and we can certainly see those happening for Sienna and they, and they, I think they're supporting her social learning. So we see that with Sienna and her dad that getting things right early provides that really good foundation. Um, he's not just around or nearby, he's really fully present and really engaging and joining in with her and like Janelle talked about before they have a, a relationship that's based on serve and return, a back and forth noticing and responding to each other's cues 
and those hundreds and hundreds of small moments, but they don't have to be big things, just tiny, tiny moments of interaction, most of them non-verbal, have taught Sienna that this is how relationships work. This is how relationships happen. And so she has that now as an internal working model. She takes that with her to every relationship she goes to. It gives her a sense of herself as a person who's social, someone who relates to people. And also she, I think she thinks, she knows that other people will want to relate to her too. I'm just thinking, Janelle, what you, whether you've got any ideas or thoughts about Kayla, her, um, child care, her childcare educator. And her yeah. Community. So it was no it was interesting noticing how Kayla was available to Sienna when Sienna needed her. She made herself available and accepted Sienna in because Sienna needed um, support for she and she was supporting Sienna's need for closeness. And then did you notice how Sienna was open to supporting her peers in a similar way? Mm. It shows, I think, how we model how we model relationships without sometimes meaning to, and we'll get to that in a minute. I think we can also, and it doesn't really say this, but I think I, we can make a bit of a guess that the relationship between Kayla and Sienna's dad is a, is an effective partnership. Sienna will be watching this and watching how they interact with each other, and this also adds to her understanding about what it means to be social. Um, and I think that there's probably opportunity for them both to cooperate, to communicate, um, and maybe even a relationship where they seek help with, with each other, from each other. Kayla might ask Dad what he does at home, and Dad might ask Kayla what, you know, what what might for some suggestions. And I'm just, Sarah, can I just interrupt? I'm just noticing in the chat that Rita J said that Sienna's temperament seems to really enjoy being with others, with others where other people might be more task oriented. Mm. So I think that, yeah, that's, and, that's that motivation and desire and interest in being in relationships. An interesting question to, to wonder whether that comes from nature or nurture, whether it's a temperament thing or whether people get socialised to be like that. We could spend a whole hour talking about that. <laughs> and this is what happens, we get sidetracked. <laughs> <laughs> so just to finish off, um, we were talking about how intentional the intentional teaching strategies that might be around this. And I and I, oh, I was wondering about whether Kayla was intentional about the relationship she had with Sienna and what kind of, maybe it, it depends on what kind of temperament Kayla has too and what kind of relationship model, internal working model she has. So did, she, did they just click because it was an easy relationship, which happens with us sometimes. And But I think regardless of whether it was an easy relationship or not, it's really important that as early childhood educators we're very intentional about our relationship. So Kayla's intentions may have been to be predictable and available and to respond sensitively to Sienna's attempt. So the way that Sienna came in, like you were talking about Janelle, was really critical. Kayla could have also built on this by supporting Sienna to watch others' interactions and, to, and talk about it and to name them. I think then as we move, if we think about um, Sienna as a toddler, Kayla could have given a lot of thought and intention to the environment and the routine to provide Sienna with some time and space to do that connecting, that joining, that cooperation, that sharing and interaction with her peers. But she also needs a time to be by herself and also to develop her relationship with Kayla. And I think the other really important thing for all children, but toddlers, is that opportunity for, for pretend play because mm -hmm. through play, children make sense of their world. And um, so, and and there's opportunity in play to practice social rules and, and relationship roles, and think about what, and actually have a goal what it's like for somebody else. Um, and see, the other thing that Kayla could do to Sienna is to to describe what's happening and name what's happening. And I guess the last thing just to think about Sienna in the sand pit. Um, and the intentional teaching strategies that could go around that. And there's lots of other things we could think about, but this is just one that I wanted to just highlight. There's a number of different options that the teacher might have had. One is to sit in the sand with Vienna 
and be a join the teacher could be a joiner and join in with the play and provide the language and the nonverbal instruction to show Sienna about how other possibilities and ways of interacting and joining and cooperating. Or the teacher might trust Sienna's social capacity that she's seen her demonstrate in the home corner and just wait and watch and wonder, perhaps notice and document what she can see happening. Or another intentional strategy might be that the educator might sit down with Sienna, have a chat with her about what she sees is a going on in a sandpit and what the problem is, if, if Sienna sees it as a problem at all and what the solutions might be. So I guess even just from those, those small moments in time, there's so many things that we could do and think about. But I guess the message is that we need to do them with intention. And, the la and I guess with the social focus. And I guess the last thing I really wanted to highlight too is that Sienna is clearly a confident, engaged social learner. Um, and as educators, I think it's really important that we try and find ways to make that social learning visible, not just to Sienna, but also to her family and her peers. And to do that with intention. So what we notice again and what we document is really critical to that um, process of Sienna seeing herself as social. So hopefully you've met Sienna and, and um, understood a little bit more about Sienna and as I said I would really encourage you to have a read of Sienna and maybe have conversations with, with your staff team about, about Sienna or any other case studies that you could have. Just a tiny little bit of information can give us a whole lot to, to hang our ideas on. What we'd like, well, Janelle have we got time to talk about the, the hiding boy now? Well we might just go, do you want to go through it really quickly Sarah? Yeah, have we got time Amelia? I think maybe you could touch on it quickly while we pop the next video up. Um, okay. So if you can be really quick and we can get the next video ready to play once you get through it. What were you thinking about the hiding child, Janelle? Well, just um, I noticed some of the thoughts that came through on the chat about um, people's thoughts about his intention. And I think all of those thoughts just give us clues about how we can span all the different kinds of social experiences for him. So it's from the observation or from observing his behaviour that gives you the clue to what sorts of things he might benefit from in a social world. And that's one way of um, becoming really intentional about helping a child develop socially. Mm. Yes. I think, I think having that social lens, you can put that social lens on, on behaviour, you can put it on routines during the day and I think sometimes stopping and being really focused about what we're looking at can really help us with our intentions. Yeah, and that, that leads in really nicely to the next slide that we're moving on to. So we're going to watch a little video now that Janelle and Sarah, you can maybe talk, talk us through once we've watched it. Does that sound like a good idea? Okay, so we'll just get the video playing. For some of you, um, that's just a really tiny little moment that illustrates a lot of the ideas we've been talking about. Um, and it's, all, it's a very beautiful moment too. It, 
I think. And I, I guess what it shows is that these really tiny babies have really um, amazing social strengths and capacities already, and that they, um, that, but they're supported to join to communicate with their nonverbal skills, and and they have a you know, that to and fro, that backwards and forwards is really clear as well, and that the adults around them value that, and that they. They've held them close. They've been intentional about how close they've put them together and, and supported them to be able to, to be together in that way. Very beautiful. And also the the how powerful their um, their voice was without having words. Yeah. So we'll move on to the next one. And this is um, could be a moment in any setting. Um, it's a meal time with some girls sitting around together, um, and I guess we we know that meal times offer us lots of children and us lots of opportunities to be social. But I think I was really wanting to really focus and think about two things in particular, which we've picked up on, but was also in the in the in the title of our um, presentation was about sharing. And often we think sharing is about sharing things, but Meal times offer opportunities to practice and and explore sharing as well. We can share stories, we can share space. Some children think it's okay to share food, although that might not be okay for us. But in, in lots of cultures, and this is where that there's a bit of a tension perhaps between what might happen at home and what happens in an early childhood context and helping children to make those transitions between what the social rules are in one space and what they are in another space. And, and that also is the, uh, one of the other opportunities that happens at, at a meal time is that idea of social rules. What are they? And that whole process that Janelle was talking about before about being motivated to engage in the social rules and being and staying connected and, and participating in, in the social rules of a meal time could be really explored further. And I think sometimes we, we need to be a bit more explicit and and teach children very clearly about what those rules might be. Janelle, do you want to have a talk, talk to us about this one? Or well, we might just move on to the next one, Sarah, once we're looking at the time. Yep. Maybe. Yep. Do you want to talk about the baby? The um yeah, the next photo was of babies and toddlers together. I don't know if we're moving on to it or not. <laughs> I can't talk about it if we can't see it. Okay, do you know I think it's actually I think it has been put up. Um so there's a ah. series of babies. So I'll leave you to it again. Okay. So and the thing that stands out for me with this photo was um, how everybody is quite close to each other because the children are younger. So you need more adults and you need people to be closer closer together so they can practice that interaction. And the other thing that really stands out to me is how, how much joy there is in this photo and how much delight there is in the, the children's faces and the educators' faces. But the educators are supporting all of the children, some are sitting in laps and some are interacting one-on-one -on -one with, with the educator and that close proximity I think is really is really um, important with, with groups of little children. So, so sorry about yeah. that Janelle. It looks like oh, uh, there it is. you can see the babies now. For some reason it's I could see it on my screen. I can see, <laughs> I can see it too. Yeah. <laughs> so those, those, those babies, they're having a lot of fun, aren't they? That's the that's one thing that really stands out for me. Yeah, and a lovely game, just with ice cream containers and what you can do with, with found materials. Yeah. And our last photo was the, the one of the children on bikes, which to me is a perfect a perfect uh, moment for intentional teaching. And you could teach all sorts of things in that moment depending on what's happening about um, perhaps about cooperation or negotiating or direction and math, some um, um, executive functioning, turn taking, 
waiting, and so it goes on. It's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful teaching moment. So those are just a few moments that we've um, pulled out to kind of explore and notice with a social lens, I guess, and you will have many opportunities to do that. But I think it's really helpful to sometimes be intentional about that. You can learn more from some of our Kids Matter resources, um, some connections between developing children's social emotional skills um, and the EYLF and NQS in our ebook. Um, and we've also got a, some professional learning that you might be interested in exploring, and both of those will come up on your resources page. But we're nearly to the end of the webinar and we need to move on. So um, some of you might have some questions. We haven't been able to get to much of what's in the chat. No, it's been a busy night, hasn't it? Mm. So th there's, there's a few things up on the screen, just a few housekeeping things that are that are occurring, but I guess there were a couple of things that really stood out for me in the chat that people were, were talking about. Um, there was one question that, that Carla W posed, which I think might be worth spending maybe a minute minute focusing on, and it, it's in regard to the baby, the, the video that we were able to watch. Which child is be a better communicator? Remembering that communication is a two-way street, both listening and verbal, non-verbal communication. Was one baby a better communicator than the other? What do you think? Interesting question, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. good question. And, and, we're, and because we're just seeing a, a, a snippet of a moment in time, and just in that time, maybe one, well, because communicating is listening and talking, and responding, it's really hard to see. And I think it also depends on what we value and what our social context is about yeah. whether it's it's more valuable to be the one taking charge or the one talking more or even non-verbally communicating or is it valued more to be the listener? Really good point. Yeah, yeah good comment. Yeah. Okay, so we've we've got maybe two minutes left and we've got a little bit of stuff still to go through. So I'd like I to did, say, so Amelia, I did notice yeah. somebody mention about the um the importance of play. I'm really yeah, glad somebody yeah. brought that up about um that, that play. If we have play, then all of the things we're talking about will happen anyway. Yeah, definitely. Definitely yeah. and and it, we we just, we we had that conversation ourselves, didn't we? How how play is so important, and so connected to everything that we do, and it gives us a chance to to learn and understand what what we what's happening for ourselves and each other, but also to practice it. So I guess to, to wind up, I'd like to thank both both of you, Janelle and Sarah, for for spending the time with us tonight and talking talking through social learning with us. There's been lots of things to to think about and consider, but I'm just wondering if there's a Couple of final, well, one final thought that you'd each like to share with us. Take away. Well, mine is I thought I knew quite a lot about social learning and social development, but I discovered there's lots more. And I think the other thing that reinforced me is that when you stop and drill down and think really deeply about uh, about something with other people, you discover and know what you don't know, and then you discover new things. Ooh, definitely. Yeah. yeah. My top, I'm, I'm thinking about um, social learning and it's one of the very few things that we can't learn from a book. You have to experience it to learn it. And the top tip really for supporting social learning is to start by strengthening your relationship with everyone. Now relationships are the strategy. And strengthening relationships have consequences that reach far beyond social learning and childhood, but they're critical. Thanks, Amelia. Excellent. Well, thank you again, both of you. I'm just going to click on to the next slide. As um, Janelle and Sarah have discussed throughout the evening, this is really just a beginning conversation. The, the actual topic of social learning is so broad, and we've managed to narrow it down a little bit to, to what being social means, what becoming social means, and how we can actually learn to be, learn and help children learn to be social as well. So we really encourage you to keep continuing the conversation with, with each other and your colleagues and other people in your network. But there's also ways that you can connect and network with us online. So I've popped these up and these links will be available in the slides that are available after the meeting. Now shortly, myself, 
Janelle and Tara will be leaving you. And we're very sorry to go. This always <laughs> goes very quickly this hour. Nice. But the webinar space will be open for another five minutes so you can say your goodbyes to everyone. But there's also an exit survey and you would have seen some announcements earlier um, throughout the night to I encourage you to fill the exit survey in and if, particularly if you're in a group, put in the names and contact email for anyone who's wanted a certificate so that we can get those out to you. Within probably a week, you'll, you'll be finding something and the recording should be available for you to watch again within 48, 48 hours to a week as well. But you will get an email around that. So I'm about to say goodbye, but please continue the conversation and we look forward to making contact with you again in our other spaces and in, and in future webinars. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Bye, everyone.